Okay. You can just tell me when you're you go. Okay. Welcome to Joliet's Oakwood Cemetery, where history and beauty are one. Hi, I'm Mary Beth Gannon, local historian, back to talk to you again about uh, Joliet's Oakwood Cemetery, one of our oldest cemeteries. Uh, right now you're looking at the entrance. It's 55 acres, 22,000 graves. Before I get too far in depth, if you attended my recent talk on the Ridgewood neighborhood, you'll recall that people were once buried across the road from this cemetery and up the hill. But that did not work out well and thus the need for Oakwood. Oakwood was officially incorporated in 1855. Early people involved in its formation were Jacob Henry, James G. Elwood, T.A. Mason, S.C. Ingalls, and the Cagwin family. This is a very patriotic cemetery. You will find uh, markers here for people who served in the Revolutionary War, one from the Mexican War, and 54 Civil War soldiers. We go with the 1855 date for this cemetery, but I found some talk that there were some burials here in the 1830s by those who settled in the region. However, I'm still working on getting more detail on that. A great deal of the people buried here are of English, Scottish, and German descent. They belong to various Protestant churches in our area. A uniting factor was that a good deal of them were prominent people in our area and critical to our city and surrounding town's success. Now, here we're taking a look at the Illinois Indians prior to the pioneers coming to our area. The mound in Oakwood Cemetery is believed to have been used by the Illinois Indians. Local lore is that in 1769, the Linawek tribe, for whom Illinois is named, murdered Pontiac, war chief of the Ottawa. In retribution, the Ottawa, their allies, the Potawatomi, Potawatomi, and by some accounts, other tribes attacked the Illini and drove them up the rock, eventually starving them. So you can see here uh, a nice uh, lithograph of starved rock on the Illinois River, LaSalle County, Illinois. And here's the mound inside Oakwood Cemetery. This is what remains of the Illinois Native American burial mound at Oakwood Cemetery. It stands about four feet high, but was said to be originally about twice that height. And this is in the very back of the cemetery. So if you drove straight in the main road and went all the way to the back, you'll run right into it. Uh, here's an article I happened to find several years ago while randomly searching some microfilm at the Joliet Public Library on Ottawa Street. This particular article dates from 1928. At the time it was written, 23 skeletons have been unearthed by anthropologists from the University of Chicago. The skeletons were primarily women and children. Uh, corn grinding mortar and pestles were found there as well. And I believe that the university still has uh, quite a bit from the cemetery. Hopefully it will get returned. Now here's a look at when the cemetery had wooden gates. This is a fairly old picture here. We have a Surrey with horses and, of course, the house there for the person in charge of taking the caretaker of the cemetery. Okay, next slide. And here's a view a little bit later, but still 19th century inside Oakwood. And you can see how some of the family plots are separated by ornamental iron gates, iron fencing. And let's go to the next. Uh, this is a, a wide shot I took inside the cemetery. Uh, many of the graves are hard to read today due to erosion. However, Henry Bale has done extensive research on the cemetery, and he wrote a two-part guide and map of the cemetery for the Will Grundy County 
genealogical society. So if you can't read a particular stone, you can try to match it up with his map and the information that he has. And I believe our library has a copy of this particular uh, genealogical guide. Also, I know for sure that Plainfield has a copy at their library as well. And here we are looking at John Cook's marker. In 1831, John Cook moved to Will County where he was honored on patriotic occasions such as the 4th of July. And John, of course, served in the Revolutionary War. And when he was honored, uh, it was usually for 4th of July. He died in 1837. And here's one of our more markers for one of our more famous residents, Governor Joel Matson. The town of Matson is named after him. Joel Aldrich Matson was born August 8, 1808, in New York before he came to Joliet in 1836. Mr. Matson was a businessman who had the Merchants and Drovers Bank as well as a wool factory. Matson is the only Joliet resident to become governor of Illinois. He was in office from 1853 to 1857. Uh, he used to have a house on Scott Street, not far from where Flailer's Bakery was. Uh, in 1855, Matson became the first Illinois governor to occupy the Illinois Executive Mansion. He later became president of the Chicago and Alton Railroad. But despite all his success, uh, his reputation took a bit of a hit when he was older. Uh, he was charged in the canal script fraud case uh, regarding the i &M Canal. He was accused of exchanging 20-year-old script for new state bonds. Mr. Matson maintained that he was innocent and he promised to pay back the state. Uh, eventually, the investigation was dropped. And this is a, a very elaborate mound with, I believe, several of his family members buried here. And if you look on the right of the largest monument there, you will see a tree uh, monument there, and that's also part of his family, I believe. And here's a picture of Joel Matson. Colonel Frederick Bartleson, another important name in 19th century Joliet. He was the first Will County resident to volunteer for service in the Civil War. Bartleson saw action at Pittsburgh Landing and Fort Donelson. He died of his injuries in Georgia in June 1864. And Here's probably one of the most important parts of the cemetery, or at least to me. This is the Civil War Memorial. And if you look closely on the left side of your screen, you'll see stars there. And those are GAR, Grand Army Republic, markers that have been with the graves for a very long time. We have cannon here, cannonballs. Uh, a couple years ago when the township was uh, celebrating the cemetery, they had a nice service outside this memorial. Let's look, here's another view of some of these markers. You can read some of their names. It looks like some of them were in the 20th Illinois Infantry. And here we are, another, another big name at the cemetery, Van Horn. One of the largest family plots at Oakwood is for the Van Horn family. Sir William Cornelius Van Horn was born on February 3rd, 1843 in Chelsea, Illinois. His father was the Justice of the Peace for the Chelsea District. Uh, his family moved to Joliet later on, and his father became Joliet's first mayor. In 1854, tragedy struck the Van Horn family. His father died of cholera, leaving the family with little money and a lot of debt. In order to help his family, William 
went to work carrying telegraph messages. Years later, he became general manager of the Canadian Pacific Railway. And he did such a great job at this that Queen Victoria knighted him for his accomplishment of being able to bore through the Canadian Rockies to link the Montreal area to the Pacific with his Canadian Pacific Railroad. And you'll see his family's plot is right near the burial mounds that I talked to you about a little while ago, if you drive straight back. And you'll notice next to the headstones, there's a giant rock there. And when Mr. Van Horn died, his body was carried by train from Canada to Joliet. And there's that big boulder there marks his grave. And another early name in our area is Harwood. You've heard of Harwood Post, uh, the Hannah Harwood home. And this is probably our most important Harwood, or at least to me, this is uh, Elvis Harwood. Let me go to my notes on Elvis. And Dr. Elvis Harwood was born May 17, 1824 in Wilmington, Indiana, and came to Illinois as a teenager. His early career included work as a law apprentice to Alexander Downey, and he was admitted to the Indiana Bar in 1843, but he didn't stay in the legal field too long. This very smart man also decided that maybe a career in medicine was for him, so he studied at Rush Medical College, becoming a doctor. He was an assistant surgeon during the Civil War. His political career included being a Joliet alderman, then mayor of Joliet during the late 1860s. Elvis and his wife Helen had five children. Uh, recently, I had the very distinct privilege of meeting one of his descendants, and I'm hoping at some point I can do a talk just devoted to the Harwood family, which is, of course, connected to the Kagwin family and just many of our earliest families. And unique thing about this descendant is she has all his letters from the Civil War and photographs from that time from her family of her relatives. So back to um, Elvis here. Um, he His son, uh, Dr. William Harwood uh, was uh, the American uh, Legion post was named after him. And let me see if I have his marker here. Here we go, William Harwood. And as I said, he was the son of surgeon Elvis Harwood of the 100th Illinois. It is believed that William served in the Spanish American War as a musician in 1917, he tried to enlist in the Army, but age 57, he was deemed too old. When it was learned he had worked for uh, 3M Corps in Minnesota developing new X-ray technology, he was finally accepted. On an early medical mission to France during World War I, he contracted pneumonia and died. Uh, it's believed to be the first American officer to die in this war. And as I mentioned before, the Harwoods are connected to the Cagwins. William's mother's maiden name was Cagwin, and her mother's maiden name was Scribner. And those are also street names in Joliet, named after those families, of course. And you look at this, you see the anchor on there and Harwood and the rope. Okay, and this is an Adolphe Williams sketch of the Harwood home, faded relic of a pioneer day from 1926, the article is. And I talked about Adele many times. Adele was writing about Joliet history in the 1920s. And you can see all of her sketches and articles by going to the library here on Ottawa Street and looking at the microphone for the Joliet Herald. Okay, this particular grave, I could not read the marker on, but what caught my eye about it is it's shaped like a bed. So it's like final resting place. It's very symbolic. Okay. And Catherine and William Gauger, 
Another early name for our area is Gauger. William Sr. was born in 1782 in Northumberland, Pennsylvania. He was married to Catherine Abel. They had several children, including William Jr., who was a farmer and also raised stock. The family lived in New Lenox Township. When he was 14, William Jr. went with a group of Will County men in the Black Hawk Indian War. William was joined by his brothers Daniel and Nicholas in that war. In the 1850s, Gauger got gold fever, like many of our other early residents, and headed to California. He came back here three years later. At the time of his death, Gauger owned 530 acres. He was married to Clarissa Hawkins and had four children. So as I was saying about William Jr., son of William Gauger and Catherine Gauger, here we are. This is the William Gauger home that was built about 1844, and it still stands. The land was on Gauger Road, and prior to this home being built, uh, the first post office for the area was on this land in the 1830s. And as you're going through Oakwood Cemetery, you'll notice that many of the markers have an obelisk shape. And here's one of them. This one's for Nicholas Gauger. This was William Jr.'s brother. Uh, for many years, Nicholas was postmaster at the Gauger family homestead, which I should just show you a picture of that. Okay. This is a very large mausoleum and this is for the Curry family. This is one of the first you'll see as you go in the main road of the cemetery. Colonel John Curry was born November 22nd, 1801 in Raleigh, Massachusetts. Some of his claims to fame included building the National Hotel in Joliet as well as a portion of the INM Canal. Curry was also partnered with Governor Joel Matson in managing a supply store. And on the left, here's a picture of John Curry. And on the right, this is a picture I found when I was in high school. And I found it in a state sale, and it shows the National Hotel. And you can see a little monument there from Sangers. And in the background, it says National Hotel Carl Pauly Proprietor. And here we are moving on to the Strong family. Mayor W.A. Strong, also Honorable W.A. Strong, was president of the Joliet Gaslight Company. He was born in Waterloo, Seneca County, New York, October 3rd, 1828. And he stayed there till 1850, coming to Illinois, settling in Joliet, where he shortly afterward engaged in the hardware business. He was elected mayor of Joliet in 1863, holding the office for just one year. He served several years as a member of the Board of Aldermen. Today we call them city councilmen and councilwomen. Uh, he was at one time engaged in the stone quarrying business with the firm being Strong and Davidson, owning and operating the quarry formerly known as the Wilson Quarry. He continued this business for three years and in 1865 was elected president of the Joliet Gaslight Company, which had been organized in 1858. Uh, a little side note about the photo of him on the right. If you go to City Hall right outside Mayor Odekirk's office in the hallway are photographs of every mayor of Joliet. So if you're curious what they look like back in the day, you can just go over there and check them out. And here we are with the page plot. J.D. Page here, this uh, wedding photo here. I don't believe that one's the wedding photo, but I guess it is. 
Okay, uh, this photo on the right belongs to my friends Tim and Michelle Smith of Plainfield. They are great local historians. I have a lot of respect for them. Uh, John Dean Page was born in Oneida County, New York, and came to Joliet in 1857. He is said to have only had one dollar in his pocket when he came here. I often call Mr. Page a jack of all trades. Page was fire chief here. He was also a police chief here. He switched the fire department from volunteers to paid firefighters. He also um, was pretty ahead of his time by getting horses specifically for the department so that firefighters could respond to fires quicker instead of trying to round up horses. They were already ready for the guys to go and battle fires. When he was at the police department, Mr. Page made many improvements, including new uniforms and newer equipment. Page went on to become mayor of Joliet, and he also appointed the first African-American officer to Joliet's police department. And if you didn't think that was enough, Mr. Page was also a bottler and helped invent soda, pipe, soda pop. That's right, soda pop. Uh, in 1869, he developed a process of bottling flavored drinks under pressure using carbonic gas. Okay. And if you look on the left, there's Page's Bottling House. And on the right is his home on Broadway, um, it's still there, but it had a big cupola on top of it at one time, and that's since been removed. But it's still a great house and well worth driving by. And here we are with a more elaborate marker in the cemetery, and this is for the DeMond family. Martin DeMond, and DeMond's another street in Joliet, named after another early family. Uh, Martin DeMond was born in 1803 in Rutland, Massachusetts. He married Sophia Murray in New York in 1831 and arrived here in 1834. He is among our earliest residents. Martin built Joliet's first stone building from limestone quarried from our bluffs. Uh, he and his family lived on the third floor and operated a general store on the first floor. DeMond also helped fund the construction of our first school building in Joliet. He died during a cholera epidemic in 1854. His wife, Sophia, also raised her niece, Catherine, there. And Catherine went on to marry Colonel Frederick Bartelson. And I showed you him, his photo a little bit earlier. And of course, he was in the Civil War. Here's a look at the first stone building that I was telling you about. In 1834, DeMond quarried limestone from the bluffs for a three-story building comprised of stores, offices, and a ballroom. It was completed in 1835. Uh, the convention to nominate Will County's first officials was held here. All that remains now is a marker, which can be seen over at Joliet's Bicentennial Park. And of course, this is Bluff Street. And another mausoleum here is for the Porter family. And you're looking at a picture of Edwin Porter on the right. When you hear the last name Porter, you will likely think of Porter Brewery. Founder Edwin Porter was born in Granger, Ohio in 1828 to Harvey and Harriet Colbert Porter. Edwin's father served in the War of 1812 and his grandfather was in the American Revolution. Edwin got his start in the malting and brewing business along the Des Plaines River. At its peak, Porter Brewery was making 150 barrels a day. Edwin served on the city council before being elected mayor three times. And on the left, you can see Porter Brewery. Unfortunately, this building's gone. And on the right, you can see his home. But that's still here. That is on Broadway. It's not far from the Page home. 
the porch is a little bit different than how it looked originally, but otherwise the house looks fairly intact and close to original. And as I was saying about the brewery itself, it uh, covered two blocks, it had all modern improvements for that time. The water for the brewery was furnished from two artesian wells. Uh, chemists uh, declared that it was specially adapted to brewing of beer. The, the wells were inside bedrock where no surface water could reach them. And let's see, some of Porter's descendants are still in the Joliet area. And I am friends with at least one of them. Uh, the original owner of my home, Michael Francis Lochran, was a partner with Porter at the brewery. And I've since filled my home with many different artifacts from Porter's. And speaking of beer, how about Searing? Searing is another name associated with Joliet beer. Frederick Searing was born December 19th, 1834 in Germany and eventually settled in Joliet. He worked in the service industry and was into politics prior to buying Columbia Brewery and then incorporating it as Fred Searing Brewing Company. His home today is his home that he lived in on Bridge Street. Uh, today, a lot of people call it Searing Castle. It still stands. Uh, Many years it belonged to the Diocese of Joliet, and now I believe it's a winery. Uh, there's also some remnants of the brewery on Bridge Street. At one time, every house on that particular block of Bridge Street belonged to different members of the Searing family. And here's a look at the castle on the left. It's now known as Bishop Hill Winery. And on the right, you can see what's left of Searing Brewery. Lorenzo Palmer Sanger. Uh, he was born March 2nd, 1809 in Littleton, New Hampshire to David and Polly Palmer Sanger. He started out as a canal builder before switching to railroads and other businesses. In 1845, he was elected to the state Senate one of his best known construction projects was the Illinois Correctional Prison here in Joliet on Collins Street. Sanger's daughter, Louise, was married to his business partner, William Alexander Steele. Sanger served as a colonel in the U.S. Army during the Civil War. He died in Oakland, California in 1875, and his body was brought back here for burial. And moving on to the Culbertson plot here. There's several Culbertsons buried here. Thomas Culbertson was born in Newcastle County, Delaware in 1814, where he learned the trade of milling. Culbertson came to Joliet in 1836 and later purchased the Red Mill, running it for roughly 20 years. I'll talk about the Red Mill when I get to his wife Martha's family, the Kerchivals who were also early settlers in our area. Thomas and Martha had three children. And on your right is Mayor Francis Goodspeed, also Honorable Francis Goodspeed. Uh, he became one of the early members of the Joliet Bar Association. He was born in Deerfield, Tioga County, Pennsylvania, uh, January 25th, 1821. He came to Joliet in 1847, where he lived until his death. He was one of our pioneer lawyers, being admitted to the bar in 1848. He studied under the direction of Honorable Hugh Henderson, a former circuit judge. He entered uh, active practice under uh, and became a law partner of O.H. Haven and this association was maintained until the death of Mr. Haven in 1854. For a brief time, Judge Goodspeed was also associated with Colonel Bartleson. And then later on, Honorable Josiah McRoberts. And he also served as mayor in 1859 and 1860. 
is said he gave a public uh, spirited administration. He was also married three times. And moving on to Peter Schaefer. I, this particular plot caught my eye. This uh, headstone is made out of metal, which I thought was kind of interesting because usually you see granite. Uh, Peter Schaefer was born in 1857 in Clinton County, Pennsylvania. He lived back and forth between Joliet and LaSalle County. It looks like he worked as a machinist. It's a very elaborate headstone, and I'm hoping to learn a little bit more about him. And when we were talking a little while ago about uh, Matson's, uh, the Matson family plot area, there was a large tree-shaped stone. Well, here's a, another one inside the cemetery, and this one's for the Schwartz family. Leonard Schwartz was born in Baden, Germany in 1861. He married Sarah Funstein in 1889. He was a contractor and builder and lived on Florence Avenue in Joliet. I chose the marker because of the tree shape. Uh, one of his family members worked for Barrett's Hardware, and we'll get into the Barrett and Underdonk family a little bit later on. Thomas Patterson. He was a farmer uh, born in Scotland and the son of John and Jane Howell Patterson. Mr. Patterson came to America in 1858, uh, coming looks like directly to Well County. He married Miss Agnes Palmer of England. They had three children. He owned 120 acres of improved land. And speaking of Pattersons, here we are with John Patterson of the firm of Patterson and Longley. Uh, he was a dealer in coal, wood, and coke. He was a native of Newburgh, New York, born, and let's see, this is a different Patterson. I'm going to go past this one because this one has a different birth date. Let's go on to Brooks. William S. Brooks came here from New York and went into the hardware trade. He later became president of Joliet Wire Fence Company and also served in the Illinois State House of Representatives. Uh, Ward and Sally Knickerbocker. Lieutenant Ward Knickerbocker, born October 1834 at Kinderhook, New York came to our area in 1850. He was the grandson of Philo Knickerbocker who fought during the American Revolution. Ward, when he came out here, he started farming and then became a businessman. He was also the postmaster in New Lenox. In 1861, Knickerbocker enlisted in Company F of the 64th Regiment. He moved up to Sergeant, Lieutenant, and then Captain. He was injured in Atlanta and ended his service in 1864. His diary from the war is detailed in George Woodruff's book, 15 years ago. And I believe that is also available at the Joliet Public Library. Adam. William Adam was born 1821 in Scotland, coming to Joliet in 1850. He started out with a lumber yard, then a flour mill before opening a wire business. William and his son owned Adams Wire Company. The company made barbed wire and bale ties. Folger Adams switched the company from making wire and fencing to prison locks and keys. And this particular one caught my eye because it's a very decorative urn inside the cemetery. There aren't too many of these left. I'm not sure which family it belongs to, but I, I chose it for its aesthetics. And the same with this particular one that's also on the curve going toward the exit of the cemetery. Uh, Corporal William Roberts. He was in the British Army and Crimean War, veteran Corporal William Roberts. 
Uh, before the charge of the Light Brigade, he was detailed as a dispatch rider. Uh, this helped save his life. In 1860, he came to the U.S., became friends with James Ducker, which, of course, Ducker's department store. There was a provision in Mr. Ducker's will that Roberts be interred in the Ducker family plot upon his passing, which occurred in 1916, several years after Ducker died. His grave was unmarked until 2003. And uh, one of our great benefactors in the area, John Leach, provided the stone and a plaque with Tennyson's famous poem. Thank you, Mr. Leach. Uh, here we are, Charles Clement. That's another early name in town in another street named for an early family. Charles Clement was born in Windsor, Vermont in 1810, moving to Joliet in 1834. He was active in the mercantile business. He was also instrumental in establishing the Joliet Courier, which later became Joliet Signal, uh, one of our earliest newspapers. Clement was the first supervisor elected in Joliet Township. He served three years in that position. In 1850, uh, the Board of Supervisors met for the first time. Each town had one representative. The population for this area in 1850 was approximately 4,650 people. Clement was married to Miss Cordelia Wilcox. They had two children. So if you were driving along Western Avenue in the upper bluff of Joliet, you'll notice there's Clement Street and Wilcox Street. They both run the same direction, uh, just a block apart, a couple blocks apart. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. And Humphrey Sprague, this was one I didn't have time to finish. We're gonna keep going. And Reynolds, we'll keep going. Rough. And now on to Higginbotham family. And these are, are among our earliest settlers. And Henry's son, of course, was a partner with Marshall Field at the department store, uh, Field and Lighter. And during the Great Chicago Fire, uh, Mr. Higginbotham's son was entrusted with all the paperwork and receipts from the store. And eventually his son went on to run the 1893 Columbian Exposition World's Fair. And a lot of people talk about the house that belonged to his son on Cherry Hill Road on Route 30 by Cherry Hill Road that's since been uh, demolished. But uh, the family had another early home, of course, in this area. And you can see a sketch of it here on the right by Adelphi Williams. And we're on to the Pickles grave and the Pickles mansion here. And the mansion still standing. It sold not that long ago. It's on Eastern Avenue across the street from the Jacob Henry home. On December 6, 1861, blacksmith Benjamin Pickles was murdered. It's probably one of our most famous cases, at least for the 19th century. It happened on a Friday. Pickles and his two sons, who were ages 14 and 16 at the time, were working late in the blacksmith shop to finish some iron railings that were needed for a new building. And that's when a bullet was fired through a window into the blacksmith shop, striking their father. Officers immediately suspected Benjamin Pickles' brother-in-law, William Zapf, who had threatened the family be over a dispute. Um, Anyway, Zapf confessed to his wife about the murder. The constable was able to testify about what he had heard Zapf say. In Zapf's first trial, the jury came back with a guilty verdict, but the judge found some technical irregularities and granted a motion for a new trial for Zapf. The second trial started in January of 1863, more than a year after the murder. And once again, Mr. Zapf was found guilty. 
and somehow he was granted a third trial. And for the third time, the jury found Zapp guilty of murder. But on uh, the night of July 24th, 1863, six guys managed to escape jail by digging a hole in the south wall of the second floor cell they were in and escaped by climbing down on dangling bed ticking. So uh, no justice for Mr. Pickles and apparently Mr. Zapp got away with murder. Letty Burlingame. Letty Lavila Burlingame was the first woman lawyer of Will County, and she was president of the Equal Suffrage Association of Joliet. Very ahead of her time. All right, here's a marker. It's not fancy at all, but it's probably, if I could meet anybody who ever lived and was later buried in that cemetery, this is the person I would have loved to have met. And this is Adele Faye Williams, artist, writer. You see the palette there? Uh, Adele, as I mentioned earlier, uh, worked for the Joliet Herald News in the 1920s and 30s. And she was very fascinated by local history. She would find things around town that were old then. And she would write about them, their history. She'd go interview people. And not only did she write about them, she would also draw and she would draw a house. One time she did an article about an early tree that was believed, I think, to be like maybe four or 500 years old in our area at that time. And whatever inspired her. And this is her marker. We'll go on to our next one. And this is one of her sketches. Okay. And this one is for an old dwelling on Richard Street. Let's go on to Elwood and Leach families. And you see on the right by that frame, you can tell that once again, that's coming from Joliet City Hall with the Hall of Mayor photos. And Elwood is another early name. James Elwood was born in Joliet. His early education was in private schools here. He went out east and graduated from military school in New Haven, Connecticut in 1857. Uh, his father gave him the choice of attending Yale or studying in Europe. He studied for a year in Switzerland, uh, then went to Berlin, Germany for further studies. When the Civil War broke out, James wanted to enlist, but it took almost a year to get his mother's permission. In July, 1862, he helped organize the 100th Illinois Volunteer Infantry and was commissioned captain by Governor Yates. Uh, in Joliet, he worked as the secretary of Joliet Gas Company. And in 1877, he went into partnership with Judge Parks. And Judge Parks was his father's uh, old partner. And the two of them together created the first National Bank of Will County. And moving on to the Sterling family. Bear with me. I'm not finding my notes on this one. But, of course, you, you think of Sterling, you will think of Dr. Sterling, who uh, probably our, our most famous historian, and he's still around. And I'm going to keep flipping my notes here till I find it. And I will probably come back to this one momentarily. Let me keep going. Uh, Robert Stevens. Okay. In 1872, uh, Ro Captain Robert Stevens was elected mayor of Joliet. His family settled here in the spring of 1831. And notice the ornamental fence going around here. Uh, let's see. Captain Stevens' wife was Lydia Ann Pence. Let's see. We'll keep going here. Cagwin. Okay. Many of the surnames I'm mentioning tonight are also names of local streets and roads. 
If you're wondering how these streets got their name, now you know. Cagwin is a street in the St. Patrick's neighborhood in Joliet, and that is named for the Cagwin family. Their patriarch is Abijah Cagwin. As I mentioned earlier, I, I recently had the pleasure of meeting a direct descendant of this family. And here we are. We're looking at Merritt and Abijah Cagwin. This is uh, father and son. Abijah was a dealer in Abijah. Sorry, Abijah was a dealer in grain. Uh, he was born in Oneida County, New York, May 19th, 1807. Uh, in 1824, Abijah came to Joliet and settled about two miles uh, from town, which was on Juliet. Uh, he built a sawmill, in which he sawed the lumber used in building the first grain warehouse in Will County. Uh, which Abijah erected a few years later. He was elected justice of the peace, serving eight years. In 1839, Abijah Cagwin was elected county judge and moved into our city, out from the city limits. Uh, he later established Will County Bank, uh, the firm of Cagwin, Higginbotham and Company. He was also engaged in grain and produce business. Cagwin served three times as city treasurer, a term on the board of supervisors, and four years as superintendent of Will County Alms House and Poor Farm. Abijah's son, Merritt, was also highly accomplished, uh, but from the sound of it, a bit restless with his multiple careers. He worked at a dry goods store until 1848, then went into Chicago working as an auctioneer before coming back to Joliet. He then got gold fever in 1850s and stayed only a year out west before returning home. He built the Mason block, but that was destroyed by fire a few years later. Uh, Merritt eventually bought land in Wilton Township and created a protection fund for the wives and children of soldiers. He was married to Mary Jane Wheeler. She died young. Cagwin's second wife was Ambrosia Higginbotham, a cousin of his first wife. And here we are at the Beam plot. Charles Beam was listed in uh, a city directory as having a farm at Cass and Eastern Avenue in 1872. He was also a Civil War veteran. And cutting. Charles Cutting was born in 1843 in Danvers, Essex, Massachusetts. His family had a jewelry business on Jefferson Street in Joliet. You can see the Cutting building on the right, uh, and it's still there. Uh, it was done in the Richardsonian Romanesque style. Uh, the building looks a little bit different now, and it's currently being used by a local law firm. If you go on Jefferson by the courthouse, if you just look for the top of the building, then you'll, you'll figure out which one it is because the bottom looks different than how it did back in the day. Um, Edmund and Sarah Wilcox. And Wilcox, like we talked about before, another street named for an early family. Edmund was born in 1816, came here from Onondaga County, New York in the 1830s. He had a store with his uncle, Charles Clement. Uh, the Mercantile was at the corner of Bluff and Exchange Streets, and Exchange was the name of Jefferson Street, the original name. Uh, Edmund helped lay out our wards in our city government in the early 1850s. He also helped out with the development of the Rock Island Railroad. And here's an Adele Faye Williams sketch of the Wilcox home, which unfortunately is no longer around. And this is the Hauk plot, H. Hauk, uh, Henderson Hauk. Uh, Henderson Hauk was born in 1806 in New York State. He was married to Governor Joel Matson's sister. 
Hauk was a farmer as well um, as building and operating flouring mills. Kerchival. James C. Kerchival was a native of Ohio and emigrated to our, our state in 1830, one of the original pioneers who came here. And here's a look at the Old Red Mill. The Old Red Mill was on Hickory Creek near the present entrance of Pilcher Park. A fire reduced it to ruins in 1930. But during its heyday, the Red Mill served farmers within a 40 mile radius. And here's one I picked also for aesthetics. This is for Mansfield Young. Mansfield Young was a tea merchant. He came here from New York City. He was born in New York City in 1830. Young and his parents came to Will County in 1849. Uh, they were farmers. By the mid 1850s, Young went back to New York for several years, uh, working in the manufacture of hats or haberdashery. When he came back to Illinois, Young was a tea merchant. Young's wife was Sarah Walker. Mr. Young was a member of the famous 7th Regiment, uh, NYNG. And we are on to the Swinbank family. One of my favorite homes uh, along Cass, and there, there aren't that many left anymore on this particular stretch. Uh, a lot of them have been replaced by strip malls and other businesses. But here's one that's still there, and this is a Swinbank home. And it was owned by William Swinbank. William was from Kendall, England. His father was in the rolling mill business. And uh, William worked at the rolling mills in Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and finally in Joliet. And this is where William and his wife Mary lived uh, prior to their death. It's right across from Daybreak. And at one time, this block and several others along Cass were full of Victorian mansions. Uh, what's nice about this home is it has a Joliet limestone foundation. Home was built in 1889. It was remodeled in recent years. And this is now a local landmark. I'd also like to note that Mr. Swinbank built the Swinbank Terrace on Hickory Street, which has recently been remodeled. And you can see Swinbank Terrace. It's right by the corner of Jefferson and Hickory, uh, close to Oneida Street. And here it is, Swimbank Terrace. A lovely old red stone building with limestone foundation. And Barrett Underdark family. William and Clamana Underdark Barrett came to Joliet around 1850. William worked as a tinner for William Strong's hardware shop. Barrett, W.S. Brooks, and William Strong Jr. bought out the store a few years later and began our beloved hardware store, Barrett's, which listed several generations and was located in different spots around town. I collect many items, uh, or as many as I, I can find from Barrett's hardware. And I was lucky enough to get original copies of some family business photos, as well as some various memorabilia from the store. And this particular photo came from the Barrett Hardware Auction. And you can see the totem pole on the left. I believe this is the same totem pole that was later placed in Pilcher Park. And here's some more Barrett memorabilia. Um, the sign on the right was for the union workers to show that they had union employees inside the store. The clerks were all union members. And the tray on the left, which uh, houses Joliet milk bottles, um, says Barrett's on it. And this was also purchased from the Barrett Hardware Auction. And what's unique about it, uh, there's a handle on the left and a handle on the right. And there were, was a rope on each handle. And when somebody didn't feel like going all the way upstairs to grab something at the hardware store, somebody would pull up the tray with the pulley and put that small item in the tray and then lower it to the first floor or vice versa. Laraway. 
in yet another early family here. This is where most of them are, not all, but most of them are here. Um, Lairway family has ties to the Richards family, which I'll discuss shortly. And these two pictures belong to Eileen Richards Clark. She is a wonderful researcher of her family tree. And her tree includes the Richards and Laraway families. And the picture on the bottom looks like it came out of an early atlas from town. And then the photo is her family photo there. And let's look at the next one, David Richards. David Richards was born in Herkimer, New York in 1813 and headed west in 1837. He started in the dairy business, then went into meat. When Illinois went bankrupt in 1842, Richards began supplying con contractors on the i &M Canal. He was also involved in the local woolen mills. He built his home at the corner of Washington and now Richards Street in 1860. He was married to Miss Mary Laraway, and they had several children. And here's a, another Richards uh, grave. George Richards, like many of the people we're talking about, uh, was from Herkimer County, New York, born 1830, and was here in the 1850s. He was employed for many years by the Rock Island Railroad. His first wife, Vanera Carr, lived to age 25. They had three children. He married again uh, to Marianne Polly Houston and had one child. Uh, F.S. Bowen, and here's another picture from City Hall of a Joliet, early Joliet mayor. And to give a brief Bowen family history, one of the best known Bowens in our area was Dr. Bowen, who was born in Berkshire, Massachusetts, 1803, graduating from the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Fairfield, New York in 1827. He married Mary C. Shoemaker, they came to Illinois in 1834. They had four children, including uh, Major Rodney S. Bowen of the 100 Illinois Volunteers, who was fatally injured in the Battle of Franklin, December 1st, 1864, and died two days later. And here's another Joliet Mayor, Furman Mack. Furman was born in 1817 in Bethel, Pennsylvania, coming to Joliet in 1837. He had a wholesale and retail shoe store with his brother, John. Uh, Furman was mayor of Joliet from 1857 till 1859. And on to the Parks family. Gavion D.A. Parks was born in Bristol, New York, September 17, 1817. He was educated in Lockport, New York, and admitted to the bar in 1841. He came west in 1842 and settled in Lockport in this county where he remained until 1849 when he was elected county judge and moved to Joliet. This was his home until his death in 1895. Judge Parks was a said to be a great lawyer who understood law and its construction and was, quote, equally happy in its application to the case in point. Uh, he was said to be uh, warm, warm and friendly to law students and would often help them. Let's see. Let's go on to our next one. Uh, George Woodruff. Okay. George Woodruff, born in Watertown, New York, December 7th, 1812. Settled in Joliet, 1836, where he established a grocery store. And in 1841, where he settled on his Plainfield farm. In 1843, he resumed his mercantile business, which he ran for about another 15 years. In 1852, he erected the Woodruff Grain Warehouse and continued in the grain trade until 1864. In 1858, uh, he, along with others in town, founded the Joliet Bank uh, and then was later reorganized as First National Bank. Uh, 
let's go on to our next slide. Salmons family. William T. Salmons, born May 3rd, 1800 in Fonda, Montgomery, New York. His first wife was Julie Ann Schuler. They had four children. Second wife, Rebecca Sadler, and they had five children. It looks like he lived in Troy Township in the 1860s. I am still looking into getting more information about his occupation. I know one of his sons had a farm in Troy Township, and it might be safe to assume he farmed as well, but again, more research needed. Another son, Carlton, was a private in the 12th Illinois Cavalry Regiment during the Civil War. And here we are, Barton Smith. Barton Smith, born December 14, 1796 in Tennessee. His family came to Joliet in June of 1835. He initially lived in a log house until he could build another home. He farmed, but he was also a police magistrate and a deputy county collector. He and his wife had four children. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna see if I can go back to the Sterling plot. So bear with the shuffle here. Almost there. Thank you for your patience. Here we are, Sterling Plot. Uh, as uh, I mentioned, Dr. Sterling, a great historian. Uh, let's see, his family member was the sexton of Oakwood Cemetery, and his ancestor Clarence also owned Sterling's florist on the corner of Cass and Walnut Street. For many years, the Sexton's home was located just inside the cemetery gate. I believe I showed you that at the very beginning when I mentioned the home for the caretaker of the cemetery. And let's go on to our next slide. So we'll do a quick shuffle to where we were. And it's nice to see these more than once. So. Again, thank you for your patience. Okay. Woodruff, Salmon, Spartan, Sterling. There we go. Okay, here's one that many people talk about, and this is Emma. And I saved her for the end of my talk. I, I first noticed Emma in the late 1970s when I was a little girl. Uh, Emma was for Emma Oxner. Her marker is probably the most eye-catching of all the graves at Oakwood. The statue of her is fairly close to Cass Street. People often leave toys and rosaries in tribute to the little girl. Ten-year-old Emma was killed July 2, 1897. Emma and her brother were on their way to watch a funeral procession when she was electrocuted. She came in contact with a wire by a telephone pole. Her father, Albert, was the chief engineer of Searing Brewery. He rushed to the scene and realized the wire was electrified. He tested it and was thrown in the air and was rendered unconscious for several minutes. And so here we are wrapping up another great history talk. And there's so much more to say about Oak Oakwood Cemetery. So many plots I didn't cover, but hopefully we can repeat that down the road. So some of the other talks I've been working on this year are the North Side of Cass, the Joliet Country Club, Patriot Joliet, Marquette Gardens, German Joliet, unexplained paranormal things that have happened in the Joliet area over the years, uh, Joliet Farms and the traditions of harvest in our area, and also vintage Joliet Christmas. Best way to reach me is through email, marygannonnu at gmail.com. And thank you again.
Oh, dear Lord, how long was that? I probably talked way too long. No, you're good. 